Welcome, everyone. My name is Alex Weiser. I'm the Director of Public Programs of the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. As many of you know, at the center, the core of YIVO is our archive and our library. Our collections contain more than 23 million documents and over 400,000 books chronicling Jewish history and Jewish culture all around the entire world in many, many different languages. Um, one of the amazing uh, treasures, one of the amazing categories of treasures in our archive is about the Yiddish theater. And Elisa Quint is a scholar who's been here working on the Yiddish theater collections in many different forms um, for many, many years, and most recently as a part of uh, the Vilna Collections Project as a scholar in residence and now working on our online museum. And so we're really thrilled to be able to celebrate the launch of her new book, largely researched using Evo materials and um, chronicling the rise of the modern Yiddish theater. So without further ado, I'm gonna now bring up to the stage Anita Norwich, who's gonna say a little bit about the book and then uh, introduce Elisa. Anita Norwich is Collegiate Professor Emerita at the University of Michigan and is serving this year as the National Endowment for the Humanities Senior Scholar at the Center for Jewish History. Her most recent books include Writing in Tongues, Translating Yiddish into the 20th, 20th Century, and A Jewish Refugee in New York, translation of a novel by Kadia Moldovsky, which is appearing next month. And we're gonna have an event celebrating that on May 2nd here as well, so I hope you'll join us again for that. Please join me in welcoming Anita. Actually, it's appearing tomorrow. They, they moved it up. What happened? Thank you. I am really delighted to introduce Elisa Quint, who, as you heard, is the senior scholar of YIVO's online museum. In addition to other projects, she's working on a much anticipated two volume anthology entitled Women on the Yiddish Stage, which will be out next year. I also have the pleasure of introducing her excellent book analyzing the rise of the modern Yiddish theater. My own work of late has been in and about translation of Yiddish, and it has been guided by a desire to make sense of an assertion by the great cultural critic George Steiner. Steiner reminds us, and I quote, that translation into a world language can make a general force of texts written in a local language, end quote. More than that, he goes on to claim that translation can illuminate, compelling the original, as it were, into reluctant clarity. I think that if we substitute the word theater for the word translation, we begin to get a sense of what Elisa's book accomplishes. Putting stories and characters in front of an audience, theater makes a general force of texts written in Yiddish. It illuminates compelling words on a page into some sort of clarity on a stage. Several things are made clear in this book. The truly cosmopolitan nature of the early Yiddish theater is one of them, as is the fact that Yiddish cultural production must always be considered in its multicultural, multilingual context. The audience for early Yiddish theater in Eastern Europe was varied. Not only Jews sat in those seats, not everyone, Jew or Gentile, knew Yiddish. Everyone knew more than one language. Men played women's parts until women forcefully entered the scene, literally. Avram Goldfaden, the major but by no means only figure in Elisa's book, was long called the father of Yiddish theater. He was, rather like New York's Ab Khan of the Forverts, a peremptory, often an irascible boss whose actors were none too fond of him. He was also a thoroughly modern man who loved Yiddish and Jewish culture and the theater and Russia and the idea of Zion. And like Shalom Aleichem, Goldfaden found New York to be a huge disappointment. In this book, he and the theater he helped create emerge in all their complexity. Elisa illuminates all this while also challenging long-held beliefs about cultural possibilities in cities versus Stettlich and the tensions between high and low culture, and much more that will become clear in her own remarks 
and in the musical program that will follow her. My major contribution to this evening is to say, read this book. And now, Elisa, quit. Welcome, welcome everyone to, um, to the EVO, and thank you very much, colleagues and friends and family, um, for making the effort to be here tonight. Um, I want to thank uh, Jonathan Brent and EVO's board of directors for supporting my work and for really for facilitating such an exceptional staff and community here at the EVO. I'm fortunate to work with a group of supportive and talented colleagues who have also become close friends. Tonight, I'll single out Evo's uh, director of programming, Alex Weiser, who's also a talented composer, and without whom I could not have arranged this program, and especially the music for this program, since existing arrangements were so archaic um, as to make them unusable. So thank you, Alex, for all you do. And thanks to Anita, whose presence at the center is truly the gift that keeps on giving, um, both in terms of her expertise and scholarship and her warmth and her collegiality. When I was, um, when I was mostly a stay-at-home mom during the years following the defense of my dissertation, I got an email from Jeff Edelstein, then the managing editor of the Evo Encyclopedia. He wanted to know if I would be interested in writing entries for the encyclopedia. One on the social conduct of Jews in Eastern Europe, and a second one on hygiene and self-grooming of the Jews in Eastern Europe. So two questions immediately popped to mind. How many people did Jeff ask to do this before he turned to me? And second, how could I resist such strangely irresistible topics? And without the credentials perfectly matched for the task, I accepted. These short entries forced me to see history and culture in terms different than I had considered it. And after writing these entries, I thought about taking my dissertation on the first days of the Yiddish theater off the shelf and reworking it in a way that felt more satisfying. As I had written it, the dissertation focused on the theater's chief pioneer, Avram Goldfaden, a Russian Jewish intellectual who began his career as a Jewish poet in the 1860s and then began mounting theatrical productions that consisted of Yiddish language versions of the middle brow operators that were so popular in his day. The height of his activity when he managed to convince Russian authorities to permit Yiddish public performance lasted from 1878 to 1883. A small window, yes, but one that included a watershed moment in Jewish history. This era is best known for the wave of violent pogroms that struck southwestern Imperial Russia beginning in 1881, and in response, the reorientation of many Jewish intellectuals towards brands of Zionism and socialism. But this turn in Jewish politics in particular and the vigorous intellectual life pursued by so many of Goldfaden's peers did not provide the theater's rise with great explanatory power. And it did not reflect the culture that Goldfaden carefully crafted around him. Even writing about their lives from points much later, no self-identified Yiddish actor of this period could care less about politics or ideology. Considering the question of social conduct as a category in and of itself, prodded me to reconstruct aspects of the Yiddish theater's rise that I had not noticed before. Their cultural awakening happened less in the minds of these actors than in how they perceived themselves through the eyes of others, whom they could imitate, their social conduct and changing habits of self-grooming, and how these were tools of self-promotion for them. For whom do I toil was not their burning question. Rather, they wondered, how can I inhabit my character 
and how much do I have to pay off the municipal authorities to perform? Actors who emerged even from the humblest of circumstances remade themselves with a good shave, uh, a short jacket, and performance, both on and off the stage. There's something ironic about writing history. In order to know everything you need to, you engage and immerse yourself in the work of previous historians, but then you need to betray it. Um, you need to pry your head loose um, enough from it to reimagine a different gloss on the same events. In many ways, I wrote this book on the shoulders of historians who wrote during the interwar period. They wrote in Yiddish in the Soviet Union, um, Poland, and the United States. They were giants of Yiddish cultural history, and more or less, they shared a common angle on Goldfaden and the Yiddish theater. But there are inconsistencies in their story that I first noticed in geographic terms. These historians attributed the Yiddish theater's momentum to the creative energy of the Yiddish-speaking masses, who, according to them, were both Goldfaden's first audiences and his first actors. And these rough-hewn actors drew on their vernacular performance traditions as wedding jesters or as synagogue choristers that Goldfaden then harnessed so expertly for his stage. But on the other hand, when I pored over their footnotes, these historians continually qu quoted the Russian language press, newspapers in St. Petersburg and Moscow and Odessa. Why would a kind of shtetl-bound culture claim coverage by a city press? Digging into other works of history helped me distance myself from these inherited paradigms, and one idea in particular from a Russian historian was helpful. In his work on social class in the 19th century, um, he began with the following question. What if the Russian Revolution of 1917 had failed? This question opened his eyes to a different picture of the 19th century. It illuminated for him a rising middle class and a growing capitalist economy that was there but had been neglected by historians for a narrative that made sense of the revolution. In other words, when we take an event, hear the revolution, we look for what led to it and we don't see what was just as much there but exerted less influence over time. I am not suggesting, at least beyond the confines of this auditorium, that the Yiddish theater is as historically momentous as the Russian Revolution, but I did ask myself, what if the Yiddish theater had never happened? What if the Tsar had never issued permission enough, um, even for this small window of time? And the answer, if Jews had no Yiddish theater to go to, they would have gone and did go to theater in other languages. As I discuss in my book, in cities throughout much of the century, they visited all theater on offer, which was mostly state-subsidized Russian language theater, as well as operetta in Italian and German and French. When Goldfaden hits the scene and Yiddish theater emerges, it quickly begins to compete with these subsidized companies. In Odessa, for instance, the resident city of the Yiddish theater, um, a Yiddish theater troupe played regularly at the Marinsky Theater, which was at the time the largest theatrical venue in the city. No matter the language in which a given troupe performed, the audience for it was roughly the same. And so Jews and non-Jews visited the Yiddish theater as they did theater in other languages. What's more, the theater did not flow from the Shtetlich, from hermetically sealed bastions of Jewish full culture, uh, despite what the Soviet historians would have us believe. Yiddish theater was a product of the city, of multilingual sophisticates, educated men like Goldfaden, and many who modeled themselves on him and could fake it until they could make it. And these theater companies tried with some success to make it in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Um, cities still highly restricted to Jewish residents. So they were reviewed by St. Petersburg newspapers because they played St. Petersburg. 
uncomfortable with the bourgeois character of these venues, left-leaning historians of the interwar period chose not to emphasize this. They also avoided the language in which the Russian press would refer to them, Jewish entrepreneurial troops. It referred to them as such because they were self-financed, and in order to survive, they needed to find a middle-class audience who could afford tickets. A predominantly working-class audience would have spelled financial ruin. Some of the more upright Jewish observers of Yiddish theater complained about it, how embarrassing it was, especially before the eyes of non-Jews. But again, when you look beyond the expressions of shame to the historical details in these complaining reviews, they are evidence that a good segment of the Yiddish theater audience was not Jewish and also included substantial numbers of Jews who stopped speaking, who did not speak Yiddish or did not claim Yiddish as their mother tongue. This makes sense of something that the legendary um, actor Jacob Adler wrote in his memoirs about his first taste of celebrity during these early days. He writes, they pointed at us on the street and called out Yevreski Akhtiori. He quotes his fans in the Russian they were speaking, although he wrote his memoirs in Yiddish. One more thing before we move to the musical portion of the evening this time about the theater's rise as an institution. The Tsar's ban came five years into the life of the Yiddish public performance in 1883, by which time there were about eight Yiddish troops operating throughout the empire. And the ban killed the theater in the empire for a good long time. And this is sad, but for a historian, it's an opportunity. What's remarkable? It demonstrates that these five years give Yiddish theater enough institutional momentum to remain intact. The Yiddish theater landscape is littered with false starts, one-off performances that were shut down or just were not able to scale up. Previous historians of the theater meticulously documented each one of these fascinating moments in short articles or annotated documents um, with very charming titles. One goes, is der Yiddish Theater geboren geworden in Odessa, Yas, or Constantinople? Was the Yiddish theater born in Odessa, Romania, in Yasi, Romania, or Constantinople? But they offer little closure. If a vote were taken among people who have an opinion on the question, Yasi gets the credit as the theater's birthplace. But my answer is Odessa, for it alone provided an audience that could sustain Yiddish theater as an institution. Odessa was the Yiddish theater's Broadway. When the Tsar's edict against the theater was circulated in 83, participants of the theater waited around while Goldfaden took a train to St. Petersburg to see if the government would reverse its decision. But a year went by and still nothing. And so some participants found other ways of making a living. But within a second year, a critical mass of these actors and composers and impresarios are so invested culturally, financially, and socially in their lives in the Yiddish theater that they leave Russia to pursue, it, to pursue them. And by the late 1880s, they have created thriving Yiddish theater scenes across the border in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, in London, and of course here in New York City. Before their arrival here, a very young Boris Tomaszewski, the American Yiddish actor, had tried to duplicate Goldfaden's success that he had heard about in letters. But Yiddish theater only took off when this wave of exiles reached American shores, with a canon of 30 operettas, not yet published, but memorized by actors or in manuscript form, and a lot of these are up in our archives. And with this, the Yiddish theater can take root here in America, where its influence is imprinted most indelibly on the culture of its host country. That, of course, is a whole other book. So I will leave history here and turn to our musical program. 
So when curating tonight's musical selections, one of the challenges we faced is that a lot of the music exists only in difficult to use forms, manuscripts or hastily drafted broadsheets. I emailed with Salman Mlotik, the director of Fiddler auf dem Dach, or the Yiddish Fiddler on the Roof, about tonight's program, and he offered to give his arrangements to us. And then the musicologist and Goldfaden expert, Ron Raboy, out in San Diego, weighed in on some of our choices. In the end, Alex and I decided on four pieces that would showcase Goldfaden's musical versatility and samples of his most enduring operettas, and Alex produced clear and readable musical arrangements. So I will introduce them all of ein Fuss in one shot. Um, the first is, and they're in, they're listed in your program. Um, the first is Die Yiddische Hoffnung, The Jewish Hope. Um, it's one of the last songs that Goldfaden composed in 1897 in honor of the first Zionist conference in um, uh, Basel, Switzerland. Es drimmelt nie die Werther, The Watchman Does Not Slumber. It's also from later in his career. Um, this one from an operetta called Meili Tsioischer, um, The Righteous Advocate. And um, in this, you can listen for how Goldfaden teases a show tune out of a Hasidic nigan or uh, tune. And the last two, Gekumen is die Zeit, or The Time Has Come, a, is a duet from Goldfaden's tragic operetta named for Bar Kochba, the leader of the Jewish revolt against the Romans in the year 132 CE. In case anyone has noticed, all of these are examples so far that might um, refute the idea that Goldfaden was not politically engaged. But in this case, um, for instance, because um, this does come from this time period that I, I look at most closely, Goldfaden depicts Bar Kochba as short-sighted, and um, uh, he endangers his people, creates the circumstances of his lover Dina's death, and dies himself in a bloody battle in the operetta's final scene. Um, the duet, which appears early in the operetta that, that we're going to do here, the young couple Dina and Bar Kochba singing with, um, sing with optimism about the freedom they will win for their people. And the final piece is Die Schwue, um, or The Oath. Um, and it's from another of Goldfaden's operettas set in post-biblical Israel, Shulamis. This is his, his most famous operetta. And this is the love song by Shulamis, the shepherdess, and Avsholem, um, between, between Shulamis and um, the prince Avsholem of royal Maccabean lineage and they have met by chance in the desert and they fall in love and they pledge to marry after Avsholem returns from his obligatory pilgrimage to the temple in Jerusalem. Um, so um, that is um, the program of Einfus. This is a taste of 19th century uh, Jewish operetta and without further ado, um, I present the performers, um, Marie Marquis, Anthony Webb, and Mickey Sawada on piano. I love you, love 
Yeah. 